Hello and welcome to Tete a Tete, France 24's flagship interview show. Our guest today is Josh Paul. He served for over a decade in the State Department, overseeing weapons sales to foreign countries. He resigned in October to protest the U.S. position vis-à-vis -vis Israel shortly into the war in Gaza. He has since joined the think tank Democracy for the Arab World Now, sorry, it's known as Dawn, as a fellow, and he's with us from Washington, D.C. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed for having me. Bonjour. So you work 11 years as director in the State Department's Bureau of Political Military Affairs, which deals with uh, U.S. arms transfers and security cooperation. In your resignation letter, you say, quote, I could not support the provision of U.S. weapons into the conflict in Gaza, where I knew that would be used to kill thousands of civilians. Israel has been getting uh, billions of dollars in military U.S. assistance every year, uh, including during several episodes of war in Gaza. So what was the trigger for you this time to resign? Thank you. Well, the difference this time was really the scale and the scope of what was unfolding before our eyes in Gaza with the weapons were, that we were approving. Uh, you know, unlike previous conflicts, which had lasted, you know, days or a couple of weeks, by the time I resigned 10 days in, there were already over or almost 4,000 Palestinians dead in Gaza. Uh, and it was clear from the statements being made by Israeli government officials, uh, as well as from the number of weapons that they continue to request and which we continue to expedite, uh, that this would be far beyond anything we had seen before. Uh, yet at the same time, uh, when I raised concerns, which I had done before, uh, about the use of American weapons in that sort of context, uh, the use of American weapons to kill so many civilians, uh, I was told that there was no room for any discussion or debate. It was simply our job to keep approving weapons as quickly as we could and keep getting them out of the door as quickly as I could. Faced with that disaster on the ground uh, and the inability to debate or discuss the policy within the American government, I thought it was an important discussion for the broader American public to be having. And for that to happen, I had to resign. Right. Uh, in a report uh, published uh, just now, Amnesty is calling uh, for the U.S. military aid to Israel uh, to be halted, uh, saying that U.S. supplied weapons uh, were involved in several allegations of violations of international law. This is a similar assessment reached by a group of independent experts, of which uh, you were part. Uh, do you think that the U.S. military aid to Israel should be stopped or suspended or conditioned? So all U.S. military aid is conditioned under law based on the recipient's practices when it comes to the human rights record of individual units and based on them not restricting the delivery of humanitarian assistance. Uh, what we see the U.S. doing now in President Biden's administration is not simply a question of policy. Should weapons be cut off? Should they be leverage used? It is the fact of them ignoring American laws that apply to arms transfers and to security assistance. So before we even get to a discussion about, you know, what should the right policy be, let us follow our own laws. Right. Uh, according uh, to New York Times columnist Thomas Friedman, if Israel uh, mounts a major uh, military operation in Rafah, in southern Gaza, where uh, many of the Palestinians are, are now in dire straits, uh, even uh, over the administration's uh, objection, uh, there could be a consideration of restricting certain arms sales to Israel. Do you believe that this is really something that's being discussed and could happen? I mean, it's, it's certainly possible. I will believe it when I see it. At the same time, if you are concerned about the possibility of an Israeli invasion into Rafah, which is something that Prime Minister Netanyahu has said repeatedly he will do with or without, to quote, a hostage deal, uh, then the time to cut off those weapons is now. The time to cut them off is to prevent them from being used in Rafah, not in the wake of the operation. That would just be pointless. Right. Uh, the uh, Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, uh, is to report to Congress whether Israel complies uh, with the National Security Memorandum 20, as it's known, which was issued by President Biden, whereby U.S. weapons recipients are required uh, to prove that they will not violate international uh, law. Uh, Israel uh, pledged that it would abide by this. And now the State Department on Monday, April 29, said five units of the Israeli military uh, were found to be responsible for human rights violation, uh, but that nevertheless, uh, they will continue to receive U.S. military backing. What does uh, this stance mean to you? 
Well, it certainly sends mixed messages, doesn't it? I think it's important to note in the context of those five units you're talking about, all of the allegations go back to the West Bank and date from well before, in some cases, several years before uh, the current conflict. I think that's important in the one sense that it demonstrates that the US is implicitly saying this did not begin on October 7th. This began uh, many years before and has included gross violations of human rights uh, conducted by Israeli forces for many years. Uh, when it comes to whether they will report faithfully to Congress uh, in their upcoming report due under President Biden's memorandum, we will see. The evidence so far is that the Biden administration has repeatedly said that it does not believe that Israel is violating international humanitarian law. Uh, at the same time, the Biden administration has also given indications it will do all it can uh, to stop international justice bodies like the International Criminal Court from holding the uh, Israeli government and Israeli defense forces accountable. So I would be deeply skeptical that the report to Congress will provide much in the way of substance. Uh, but, you know, we must keep an open mind and we will see. The evidence is certainly manifest and is certainly there uh, for them to report fulsomely on what has been going on. Right. Uh, there were some indications that for the first time ever, uh, a unit called uh, Netza Yehuda Battalion in Israel uh, would uh, be... Uh, part of a withholding of a U.S. aid, but you think now uh, that this will not happen because Israel, Israel said it will provide more information. Do you think that this will be buried, essentially? So the State Department has said that it is looking at this information. Uh, it has, the State Department has also said the other four units it was looking at uh, will not cut, encounter any cutoff of assistance because they have been remediated, or in other words, that the government of Israel has addressed properly uh, the allegations. This is not like the process I have seen for any other country or any other security force. In the typical Leahy process, this is the law that applies, the Leahy law, um, you know, when a gross violation of a human rights is identified, assistance is cut off, and then it is a multiple years long process uh, to identify and to work with the country to ensure that there has been proper uh, remediation. In the case of Israel, we are relying on the Israeli military justice system to apply that remediation. And the idea that that system, the same system, by the way, which puts thousands of children into administrative detention uh, for indefinite periods of time, uh, is a reliable partner and is a trustworthy partner when it comes to remediating violations by those same forces uh, is very questionable. Right. Uh, according to a report in The Guardian, a senior U.S. official uh, have reviewed uh, more than a dozen incidents of violations uh, by Israel security forces since 2020 but ensure that the U.S. Uh, weapons would continue to flow uh, to the very units responsible for the allegation. Uh, this includes uh, the death of several uh, dual Amer uh, Palestinian American, uh, the journalist Shirin Abu Akhle, uh, a man by the name of Omar Assad. To, I mean, you were involved with those discussions. Uh, yes. Do you think the U.S. government is looking the other way or even covering up uh, some of those crimes in order to let this aid continue to Israel? So when it comes to U.S. citizens in particular, there is a role here not only for the vetting of the units involved in their deaths, but also for criminal investigations by the Federal Bureau of Investigation, by the Department of Justice, into the deaths of American citizens violently overseas. Uh, so where are those investigations? Where are the results of those investigations? In addition, yes, it has long been my experience, and I was part, as you say, of the a process within the State Department to review allegations against uh, Israeli security forces, a, a unique process, by the way, for Israel. Uh, and it is unique as well for Israel that it is the secretary who has to make these determinations. For every other country, these determinations are made at a much lower level. Um, and, and yes, it was absolutely my experience that for years we toiled to bring these concerns forward, bring them up to the secretary, have these units designated under the Leahy laws and that there was never any appetite at the political level, never any willingness uh, at the political levels of the State Department under any administration uh, to take action when it came to Israeli violations of human rights. Well, this, this is a pretty serious allegation. This means that uh, at a political level, there is a decision essentially to violate U.S. law. Yes, I think that's exactly right. I think that, you know, I, I was made, that sort of decision is made, I think, in two ways. First of all, from very much from the top down, uh, and we have seen that in the context of the arms transfers that we were talking about earlier, uh, that there is just a sort of general directive to move forward. There is also a fear, I think, on the part of political appointees within the State Department, on the part of Senate-confirmed officials, uh, that any criticism of Israel will be a career killer, uh, will bring them before Congress, will prevent their you know, confirmations to senior positions. Uh, and that has sort of crept down into the 
wit and uh, the woof and warp of the State Department policy making process uh, to the extent that it is, you know, really restraining our ability to follow the law. Right. Uh, this would explain why only very few State Department officials have resigned like you have. So it also explains why I think there's been so little uh, debate within the State Department. And in fact, you heard this just in the last few days from the most recent person to resign, Halo Rarit, the State Department spokesperson, Arabic language spokesperson uh, to the Middle East, uh, who has said uh, that they have, she has never in her career experienced anything like the inability uh, to discuss and debate uh, an issue as she has in the context of Israel in the last few months, uh, that there has been a culture of fear within the State Department uh, when it comes to people raising their voices on this topic. Right. Uh, just as a last question, uh, U.S. campuses, at least several of them, are seeing uh, pro-Palestinian protests. There's a lot of uh, controversy. Uh, what does it tell you? I mean, I think it is a, a significant failing of the American democratic system writ large. And then when it comes to college campuses, I think in some ways, it, first of all, it's a, a, a replication of what I saw in the State Department, where any concerns are just brushed aside. Uh, you know, I think we should also be very concerned because where there is one issue that we cannot speak about, there will surely be other issues to follow. And there is a very dangerous precedent being set right now. I think as well, let's be honest, you know, when it comes to the uh, Palestinian-Israeli uh, conflict, you know, as I and many others have said for a long time, there is no military solution. There is all, only a political solution and the voices have to be heard and we have to let each other talk to each other and listen. The same is true in the American political debate. There is no policing solution here. There is only, this is a political issue, uh, and campus administrators, rather than turning to the use of force, should be listening to their students and moving forward with their students on their concerns. Josh Paul, that's all we have time for. I want to thank you very much uh, for appearing here from Washington, D.C., and I want to thank you all for watching this show.